Apparently overnight, coronavirus mutated into a species-ending parasite. So I recommend that you wash your hands like you just met a Boston Bruins fan. <laughs> Hold it against me. I'm a Detroit Red Wings fan. So we can all get on board with our hatred of the Bruins. Can we not? Amen. Yes, yes. I was a big fan of, uh, of the Red Wings when I lived in Detroit. Their captain was Steve Eisman, one of Canada's best treasures. And then uh, he came to Tampa and was general manager of the, the uh, Tampa Bay Lightning uh, near where I live. And it was not uncommon to see uh, many, many Red Wings Eisman jerseys in the Tampa Bay arena as they were playing. Uh, and so, um, I don't know why I'm talking about this suddenly. So. Now, we now return to our regular scheduled program. Good morning. Good, morning. It's good to see you all. It was the spring of 2013 when I took my first sabbatical. A few years earlier, I had written a book called The Spirituality of Jesus, blending the disciplines of biblical studies and spirituality studies. A few years later, I followed that with a book very creatively titled The Spirituality of Paul. This sabbatical was graciously granted so that I could finally get around to finishing what I thought was going to be the last book in that series, The Spirituality of the Early Church. As sabbaticals go, mine was downright disastrous. Right as the fall semester was ending, Florida Christian College got word that its regional accreditation was being revoked. It didn't matter that the circumstances and reasoning for this move were unprecedented in American higher education history, and that no college had ever had its accreditation revoked for the reasons that they were giving to us. The writing was on the wall and it read something like, Marshall of Hospos. <laughs> Destruction is coming quickly. One of my colleagues, someone who's been at Florida Christian College since the day it opened, remarked it was the worst semester in the history of the school for anybody to be on sabbatical. During that time, I prayed a lot. There were times that I wept with the Father for the death of what we'd all gone there to build. There were times, though few, that I rejoiced in what I'd been able to be a part of. I prayed prayers of thanksgiving to be able to serve in a line of succession, descending from men like Roger Chambers, Glenn Bourne, James E., Doc Smith, Mike Chambers, and Jim Chester. But to be very honest, the bulk of my prayers weren't all that pleasant. I spent Christmas break that year in the cornfields of central Ohio at my in-laws, screaming at the Father, praying in images I learned from David, with an audacity I inherited from Abraham and in a tone that would make Jeremiah cringe or proud. <laughs> it was a dark time, and my prayers reflected it. As you can imagine, my sabbatical was rocky. The uncertainty of our future occupied the central place in my mind. I did not get very far on the book. But about 30 days into the sabbatical, I got the opportunity to write an article on prayer for the Lexham Bible Dictionary. I'd written two articles for this dictionary previously, one on Son of Man, one on food, and was eager to work with them again. At first I thought, this will be easy. I can write this article in 20 minutes. And then I talked to the editors and found out what they really wanted. The scope of the article was not going to be theological, asking what prayer is, who we pray to, how to know if God is really listening. That would have been easy for me. This piece that they wanted was historical. Tracing the historical development of prayer from its ancient Near Eastern antecedents to the form and function of prayer in the Hebrew Bible to Qumran through the New Testament and into the early church. I've got two master's degrees, one with a concentration in biblical studies and a doctorate in spiritual formation. I was not prepared, trained, or qualified to write this one. I've seen 1408, but this terrified me. I took the assignment and spent the next 45 days reading, researching, and writing in areas in which I was credentialed, but not well studied. And what I learned during that time helped me, not only academically, but also spiritually. During that time, I discovered a freedom and intimacy in prayer that exists only in a dialogical relationship with Yahweh through His Son, Jesus Christ. So in our time together today, I want to bring to you some of the fruit of that research and do a brief history of prayer from Egypt to Sumeria and ancient Babylon, to the prayers of the early Hebrew Bible, to the prayers of the temple priesthood, to those of the intertestamental period, and ultimately to the New Testament. I'm hoping this won't be just a big boring history lesson, but that the insights that we'll glean from this kind of study will, as we've said all along, help us learn how to pray. 
So here's where we've headed. As you are aware, for, um, those of you who have been here, you know this. This morning we're doing a meeting lecture, then followed by discussion groups, and while tonight we're doing something on the parables. Um, Tuesday, we spent some time learning to pray like Jesus. Yesterday, praying the gospel with Paul. Today is a brief history of prayer, and I'll try to make that as brief as possible. And then tomorrow, we'll dive into the hymns of the Revelation. Now, I am working from some predetermined limitations, not only because of our time frame, but because I am in these areas, like Peter and John, ignorant and unlearned men. In this lecture, I'll fo focus mostly on Judeo-Christian prayer, which means leaving out the prayers of other religions, primarily those of Islam and Buddhism. Because I am a Protestant, that's where my interests lie, and I will not focus on the prayers of Catholicism or Greek Orthodox, though admittedly, in the earliest centuries, the church knows little difference between those things. Uh, and finally, our focus will, attention, uh, our focus will be on, on the prayers of biblical or canonical history not the history of the world. So some of our work will extend into the middle parts of the second century AD to catch a glimpse of what the early church is doing after the apostles have died, but it will be a short glimpse and not a long stare. So those are my limitations, and if it seems like I'm leaving something out, please don't assume I'm being rude or deceitful. I promise you it's not that. It's that at this point in my life, I either don't know or I don't care. <laughs> what I think you'll find throughout this brief historical survey, and this is the thesis from which I am operating, is that the history of prayer is one of finding the balance between the spontaneous, heartfelt prayer and the standardized liturgical forms. It's the story of Moses praising God in victory, only to have that prayer standardized in the Psalms. It's the story of the Shema, a clear articulation of Israel's basic creed, becoming a fixed, rote prayer. It's the story of David, pray to God out of dire circumstances only to have those prayers codified into a prayer book. It's the story of Jesus teaching us a very simple prayer only to have that prayer become a fixed liturgical discipline in the early church. It's this story, the history of the basic pattern of prayer, that I want to explore for the next few moments to see, as always, what it teaches us about how to pray well. We'll start with the prayers of the pre-Old Testament period, then move to the Old Testament period, the intertestament period, and finally the prayers of the New Testament. And just so you're aware and don't get too irritated, the first section is the longest. Okay, And then they get a little shorter as we go on. So hang with me. Please stay on the line. Your call is very important to us. In the words of the great Egyptologist ZZ Top, let's go back to Egypt because it's in the sand. And sit beside the pharaohs in the shifting sand. And for the sake of our collective holiness, that's all that song I care to quote. Our prayer journey begins with the prayers of the ancient Near East, and not just those of Egypt, but early Babylon and the Hittite prayers. Not necessarily to learn from them, but to contrast what we find there with the kind of honest, genuine prayer that appears in the scriptures. The most notable difference, and one that you'd all expect, is that the prayers of the ancient Near East are primarily polytheistic. They pray to a number of gods, not just one. In one of the most famous of the hymns, the goddess Ishtar is praised among the gods. Her word is respected. It is supreme over them. In their assembly, her word is powerful. Because the religions of the ancient Near East were rife with gods of plenty, there was a sense that not all of them were listening. So we find prayers addressed to many of them. Amon-Ra, Atan, Ishtar, Marduk, Shin, the moon god, and in a couple of occasions to more than one god at the same time. While Ammon, the supreme god of Egypt, was depicted as hearing the prayers of him who summoned him, the Sumerian prayers included more begging, more cajoling, more petitioning to listen than those of Egypt. The prayer of lamentation to Ishtar begs the goddess, quote, accept my prayers, faithfully look upon me and hear my supplication. These gods were disengaged from the affairs of humanity and had to be cajoled even to take notice, let alone act. The phrases, how long, and be appeased, recur throughout the psalm to Marduk in the hopes that Marduk will overlook sin and give ear to the words that are growing. The great gods of old Babylon, Shamash, Shin, Adad, and Ishtar, are asleep in their chambers, and they require a great deal of shouting to arouse them from their slumber. Prayers in these strata often included the consultation of omens, oracles, and magical rituals as a way of appeasing the gods' anger so that they will pay attention to 
In Elijah's day, you may recall that the prophets of Baal screamed and cut themselves to garner Baal's attention. Jeremiah and Isaiah chastised them as mute gods, gods who have no ears to listen and no mouths to speak. By contrast, Yahweh is portrayed in the Hebrew Bible as one who is eager to listen and the concerns and, uh, to the concerns and cares of his people. David said it best, I call out to Yahweh, and he answers me. By contrast, Yahweh has no counterpart in the heavens. He reigns supreme over the great assembly and judges the gods, Psalm 82 says. The first commands given to the fledgling Israelites included, you will have no other gods but me. Solidified in the repetition of Israel's creed, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh. Another thing I notice about the prayers of the ancient Near East is that they mostly focus on the attributes of the gods, their qualities and their character. Ishtar is strong, exalted, and splendid. Shamash is true, just, and glorious. There are some weird stuff in these prayers. The descriptions of the gods are replete with references to how good they smell. That's weird. I don't get that. And the Sumerian prayers praise the king for his lapis lazuli beard. You know, lapis lazuli is that deep blue stone with the white marbling in it. And he's, he's apparently got a beard that is made of that. I don't know. Maybe they've been watching the movie 300. They were jealous of Gerard Butler's beard, you know, in that film. But the, you need to watch more movies. How am I going to teach you about Jesus if you don't watch more movies? But the prayers and praise of the Hebrew Bible, by contrast... While careful to praise Yahweh for his attributes, things like glory, majesty, honor, justice, kindness, chesed, continually refer to his acts as reason to praise him. I'm not talking about the acts that could be attributed to any God. Acts of creation, rain, sunrise, sunset, moon phases, and the like. It would be easy to see those things in creation and ascribe them to any God you wanted to. What I mean are acts that are visible in public recorded human history in defense of Yahweh's people. The striking of Pharaoh's first war, his deliverance of the Hebrews from Egypt, his defeat of the opposing kings and armies who struck down Og, king of Bashan, and Sihon, king of the Amorites. These are recurring themes in the prayers of the Hebrew Bible. While the gods of the ancient Near East were praised for their attributes and their character, Yahweh is praised for his involvement in human history. His character leads him to action, and his good deeds on behalf of his people can be recounted and verified in human history. And that's a big difference from what you see in the Old Testament versus the surrounding cultures around it. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, the prayers of the ancient Near East are unidirectional, not dialogical. That is to say, the gods of the ancient Near East do not speak in return. They give little response when prayers are offered to them. In essence, they are mute. There are descriptions in these prayers of their decrees and their counsel, but it's always given in the most generic terms. They describe it. They give it no content. Ishtar gives counsel, and Shin, the moon god, gives oracles, but there are no recorded words associated with either of them. Prayer with Yahweh, on the other hand, is a conversation. God appears in the garden speaking. Adam, where are you? The first recorded prayer in Genesis is a two-way argument between Abraham and God about Abraham's childlessness. David cries out in Psalm 2, Why do the nations rage? And then is answered by Yahweh, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me. I will give you the Gentiles for your inheritance. Walter Brueggemann, one of our Old Testament scholars, has said his prayer assumes that there is something commensurate between the partners. Namely, the capacity to communicate in dialogue. That's exactly what we find in the God of Scripture. The gods of the ancient Near East communicated to their petitioners indirectly, through oracles and through omens. Yahweh, on the other hand, communicates directly with his people, answering their prayers through spoken and written words. If I had another two hours, I don't relax. If I had another two hours, I would spend another time talking about the importance of the word for Yahweh, the spoken word about dealing with one another face to face in spoken words and how Yahweh doesn't just give generic pictures, he speaks.
So these are some of the characteristics of the prayers of the ancient Near East and how they contrast with the prayer that we see in the Bible. Now it's time to open up the pages of the Old Testament and see what we find there. When we open the pages of the Old Testament, looking for the kinds of prayers that are prayed and the kinds of responses we get, there are two things that immediately stand out. And again, there's a lot to cover and a little time to do it, so if you will overlook a multitude of sins, I will be brief. The first thing we notice is that the prayers of the early parts of the Hebrew Bible were simple. They're spontaneous. They're conversational. God first appears in these passages as one who converses with Adam, with Eve, with Cain, with the serpent. There's no mark of formality or liturgy in these prayers. No, O oh thou that dwelleth above the cherubim, Selah. It is simple communication. Just talking. In fact, the most common verb used to introduce prayers of the patriarchs in the Pentateuch is the word speak. There's no formal word for prayer. It's just Abraham said to God. Their requests weren't all that lofty either. Abraham cried out to God for a child and for the safety of the righteous in Sodom. Abraham's servant asked God for guidance. Hannah prayed a song of thanksgiving for the delivery of Samuel. Typical of these spontaneous, unrehearsed prayers is what Moses cried of Miriam. Oh God, please heal her. These initial prayers, the prayers of our fathers, were what Richard Foster calls simple prayer. There wasn't anything fancy about them, and they weren't laden with all kinds of theological vocabulary. At the most basic, fundamental level, they were simply speaking with God having conversations with him in the cool of the garden, asking for simple things that only he could give. But this simple kind of prayer eventually leads to a more formalized, more liturgical kind of prayer, as the forms and requests of the fathers became more and more standardized. All of this was noticed at first, at least in the major literature, by one of the giants of Old Testament studies, Klaus Beschermann. In his landmark praise and lament in the Psalms, Beshemon noticed that some of the prose prayers of early Judaism had taken on more poetic forms in the later parts of the Hebrew Bible. To some extent, that is true. So what looks like just prose winds up being formalized into poetry later. To some extent, that is true. And we'll look at a few examples in a moment. But Beshemon's vision of how that happened set the standard for how we view the development of prayer in the academic literature. He thought it was a process of editing those original prayers in a theologically creative way so that they could be used to legitimize the ideas the author cared most about. In essence, Beshtemon, though he was not a postmodern, he bought into the notion that all language is controlled and that these prayers were being edited to legitimize the beliefs of the author. So, for example, the prayer of Ezra, Chapter 9, which contains Ezra's tirade on Israelite intermarriage with foreign people, in Beshtemon's view, was not a significant aspect of Ezra's original prayer. He didn't really pray that, that's what Beshtemon said, but was added by the priests of Israel later to protect the nation in their newfound glory. In his view, Solomon's prayer at the dedication of the temple in 1 Kings 8 wasn't really uttered by Solomon. It was composed to solidify the Jerusalem temple as the center of Israel's worship. Nehemiah's prayer in chapter 9 becomes a history of rebellion prayer designed to elicit the faithfulness of the people to prevent future rebellion and exile. The view of many scholars is, and I quote one of them, at first many different forms of the same basic prayer grew up in a haphazard fashion, and later, gradually, over the course of time, the rabbis imposed their legal norms on this vast body of material. While I do not believe in the evolution of Israel's religion with that same blind devotion that modern biblical studies expects of it, I can admit that some of this standardization did occur in the recorded prayers of the Hebrew Bible. Indeed, taking the time to actually write down a prayer and record it in the pages of what will eventually become Scripture is a measure of standardization. But this discussion has been rather technical and academic, so let me see if I can explain this in more simple terms. Take the Shema, for example. Originally a very simple creed articulating Israel's most fundamental loyalties. The Shema became one of the most important of the standardized prayers of Judaism, or the most prominent, ancient or modern. It was very simple. Love God with all you got. But in accordance with the command to talk about these things when you walk along the road, when you get up, and when you lie down, the Shema came to be recited twice a day. 
But to standardize it further, there were two factors that caused it to increase to three times a day. Daniel's practice of praying three times a day during the exile, Daniel 6, and the three times a day sacrifice mentioned in Psalm 55. Not only did the time to recite the Shema become standardized, but the manner in which it was prayed also took on a measure of uniformity. Originally, it was handed down in Hebrew. But when Greek became the lingua franca of the day, the rabbis began to insist that the people recite the Shema in Hebrew. The Greek form was acceptable in areas where the Greek Bible, the Greek Old Testament was known. Uh, but in Judea, the Hebrew form was standard. Later generations found the Amidah, which is a set of 18 prayers, um, and fixed it to the Shema, saying that it needed to be offered three times a day in personal prayer and during the synagogue services. Over time, even when the Amidah became cemented into a fixed liturgical form, it was removed from the lips of the people and recited only by the synagogue attendant, while the people could only respond, Amen. While minor variations of the Amidah continue to appear even as late as the time of Gamaliel's grandson, I'm talking about 115 AD, there is strong evidence that the core of the Amidah was basically fixed by the early first century. The Shema has become increasingly standardized over time. The same might be said of the Psalms. The Psalms were composed as heartfelt prayers of men like David, Asaph, and the sons of Korah. But quickly those Psalms were standardized for liturgical use in the temple, in the synagogues, and in the liturgies of the major feasts of Israel. Even the prayers prayed in the temple became less and less spontaneous and more standardized, drawing on the great traditions, stories, and songs of the Old Testament. Studying this tendency, Judith Newman concluded that, quote, Scripture preys upon Scripture, as the text retold God's great deeds in the hopes that he would once again act on behalf of his people. Think about the ways that you were taught to pray as a child. The original heartfelt prayers, now I lay me down to sleep, pray the Lord my soul to keep, has become standardized. God is great, God is good, and we thank Him for our food that has become standardized. All in all, the tendency in the evolution of prayer in the Hebrew Bible reflects the journey from spontaneous, heartfelt prayers to an increasing standardization as forms became more and more cemented for use in our worship and ritualized prayers. The final thing we notice about the development of prayer in the Old Testament is an increasing elitism connected to prayer. In the earliest times, anyone was free to bend the ear of the Almighty. And as early as Genesis 4, the testimony is men began to call on the name of the Lord, men from everywhere. Adam conversed with the, in the garden with God. Enoch walked with God. Abraham had a dialogical relationship with God that is at best bold and at worst argumentative. But in the wake of the Egyptian liberation, the people became afraid of God. Having seen the wonders and signs he performed, God was fulfilling his covenant with Abraham to make his descendants a numerous, as numerous as the sands on the seashore. But Abraham's descendants did not inherit from Abraham the same trust in Yahweh that Abraham had. And they became suspicious. At the giving of the covenant, they refused to speak with Yahweh directly, and they asked Moses to intercede for them. This one move, the refusal of the people to communicate directly with God, was the yeast that would eventually work through the whole dough. Because with the request to ask someone to intercede for them, God's people then became dependent upon intercessors to mediate their communication with Yahweh. Moses was one of the best. When God got fed up with the people and announced his intention to obliterate them and start over with Moses, Moses manner that would make most of our jaws drop and watch in eager expectation that God's going to wipe him off the face of the earth so speak in this way. He called God to, in, uh, to task by invoking his own promise against him. Moses said, and I'm loosely paraphrasing here, do you have any idea what message this will send the Egyptians? They're going to obliterate us and if you obliterate us, they'll think that you were powerless to save his people. You brought us out here only to let us die. You made a promise to Abraham and to me. You said, I am Yahweh, Yahweh, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Were you lying when you told me that? Or are you really going to be that guy? Because of Moses' intercession, intercession, the next verse in the text reads, and now I am not paraphrasing, I have forgiven them because of rest. And from that time on, 
men began to rely on others to call upon the name of the Lord. Most of the great intercessors were prophets. It seems that in the cultic duties of the Old Testament, that prophets and priests were distinguished by their different duties. The priest function was primarily to offer sacrifices and to perform ritual worship, while the role of the prophet was primarily to serve as a specialist in prayer. Consider what Patrick Miller has to say about this, one of our better prayer scholars. Most of the figures who prayed in behalf of others, the community as a whole or individuals within it, were prophets or were regarded as such by the tradition. These included not only Abraham, Moses, and Samuel, but also Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Amos, as well as some unnamed prophets. While on occasion a king such as David or Hezekiah prayed effectively on behalf of the people, the intercessors of Israel were primarily the prophets. The people once asked God for a king, and God said, and I'm paraphrasing again, that's a really stupid idea. It seems that the idea to ask for an intercessor also complicated Israel's relationship with Yahweh. Even the construction of the temple served uh, as an illustration of this increasing elitism in prayer among the ancient Jews. Solomon's temple was intended as a house of prayer, not just for the Israelites, but for foreigners who would hear of Yahweh's great name and flock to him. Over and over in the dedication speech in 1 Kings 8, Solomon dedicates the temple specifically to serve as a house of prayer for the nations, not the one nation, the nations. But the architectural design of the temple restricted access to Yahweh to the priesthood, making the people dependent upon professionals for intercession. Spatially, think of the way the temple's laid out, those with higher pedigrees got closer and more intimate access to God. You know, the court of the Gentiles, then you have the court of Israel, and the court of the Israelite men, and then the court of the priests, and then the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest was allowed to go in there, and then only once a year. Spatially, those who have greater pedigrees get greater access to God. Does this exacerbate our special language for prayer notions, or does this reinforce this idea in us that some people are better prayers than others? Maybe they are. It was never Yahweh's intention to have a class of priests to intercede for the people, but rather for all of Israel to be a kingdom of priests, to intercede for the surrounding nations, as he says in Exodus 19. But by the time we get to Isaiah's day, we find him criticizing the temple ministry, decreeing that God will bring those who have been cut off from temple access and now receive their sacrifices and hear their prayers, Isaiah 56. Jesus, looking round upon a temple that layered access to Yahweh from the Holy of Holies to the court of the priests, to the court of Israel, to the court of Gentiles, watching from a distance, evoked this very text from Isaiah once again to pronounce that the temple would be a house of prayer for all the nations. Though it looks like things are headed toward a very standardized and elitist trend in the Old Testament, that doesn't mean that there were no spontaneous prayers. That doesn't mean that nobody's praying in heartfelt ways. That doesn't mean that regular folks aren't praying during this time. Priests and prophets didn't have a copyright on prayer, and there were plenty of folks praying. When it comes to our study of prayer in the ancient world, all we can do is study the prayers of those who are writing them down. And they wouldn't have been written if they weren't in some ways formalized and standard. And though what we have is formal, there is a large dimension of prayer that is quite non-public, individual, private, oral and spontaneous. Rabbi Simeon was encouraging people to recite the Shema and Amidah, but not to allow their recitation of it to become a fixed mechanical task. Though the simple prayers that predominated the earliest phases of Jewish prayer development were eventually overcome in the written text by more standardized and scripturalized elements, these formal prayers are designed to lead and instruct the community in prayer and how to do it. And there is every reason to suppose that personal heartfelt prayers continued to be offered when the people dispersed from their standardized worship. Now, for a brief intertestamental interlude. I want to keep this rather brief because I really want to get to the New Testament stuff. That's where my heart is, and our time is running short. The development of prayer in the intertestamental period is a continuation of this trajectory, of the struggle to maintain heartfelt prayers and yet to be ceremonial. Two developments 
uh, that I want to mention in this time period. The first is the formation of what we call the synagogue. We don't really know when the synagogue began, but we know that in some ways it served as a surrogate for temple worship for people who could not live near the temple. The temple services weren't replicated in the synagogue because everybody knew that certain things were sacred and they belonged in Jerusalem, like the sacrifice of the bulls and goats. The scriptures were read in the synagogue. There may have been some singing, but by and large, the central component of the synagogue liturgy was prayer. They recited the Shema and the Amidah, and yes, the tendency over time became increasingly standardized in prayer, but the synagogue at its core was simply a place to pray. So much was the synagogue identified with prayer that by the time of Josephus, the Greek term prayer was an idiom in Jewish circles for the synagogue. It was the place for prayer. The second major thing to come out of this particular period that I want to focus on is the formation of the Essene community at Qumran. This is that Dead Sea Scrolls area. The Essenes were a group of priests who broke away from the temple ministry in Jerusalem, and from the evidence we have, it seems that they split with the temple priesthood because they felt that those priests had become too morally corrupt and too rigid and heartless in their ministry. Even though this was true, we still find in their desire to be more spiritual than their Jerusalem counterparts a tendency toward this standardization in their prayers. Members of this community began and ended the day with prayer, perhaps with the recitation of the Shema. Prayers in this group were then written and standardized, and several collections of prayers, thanksgiving psalms, and blessings have been found among the Dead Sea Scrolls in addition to prayers prescribed for the community in other collections. It seems that even in their desire to be spontaneously spiritual, they still retain the measure of standardization in their prayers. So in the intertestamental period, we find that though much of the practice of prayer in the recorded literature is born in reaction against the establishment, they still could not escape the tendency to cement those prayers into fixed traditions. But hope is not lost because we're about to turn the page and open up the New Testament and watch prayer be restored to its rightful place. There is no way to quantify exactly how much and what impact Jesus of Nazareth has had, not only on the world and not only in Christianity, but in each of our lives. And I suppose that if we were to enumerate the ways and the impact that he's made on each of us, the world could not contain the books. Jesus restores things to their rightful place. He mends things that are broken, and he redeems that which is lost. And so it is with prayer. For in the ministry, teaching, and spirituality of Jesus, we find the very Son of God delivering us from our religious shackles and dogmatic forms and returning us to the more simple, spontaneous, and heartfelt communication with God. To be fair, prayer in the New Testament springs from the fixed liturgical traditions established in first century Judaism. We've spoken about that place that the Shema had in Israel's prayer life, and its place in Jesus' ministry is evident in his description of it as the greatest commandment. The earliest Christians continued to pray in the temple and continued to observe the set times for daily prayer. We've got all the biblical references here if you'd like to see them. But Jesus' example at praying and his teaching on prayer begin to liberate us from the bondage of these fixed and lifeless forms and return us to the joy of our salvation. One of the ways that he does that is in his address of God as Abba, Father. The Old Testament never addresses God this way, which I laid out yesterday in my comments on Paul's use of that term. And Jesus' use of this term was a bit of innovation in first century Judaism. That he addresses this way, that he addresses God this way, tells us that he viewed his relationship with God in very close, personal, intimate terms. That Yahweh was not a God who had to be cajoled through fancy words, and that he had the ear of the Father whenever he opened his mouth. In arguably his most famous teaching on prayer, Jesus gave us a very simple paradigm for what prayer ought to look like in what we now call the Lord's Prayer. Scholars of every stripe have noted that the Lord's Prayer has connections with and draws themes from the Amidah and the Shema. And many in Christian history have treated it the same way, standardizing the Lord's Prayer as a set, repetitive prayer. If you have backgrounds in Catholicism, you understand that probably more than I do. But at its core, Jesus' prayer here is less a formulaic ritual than it is an honest, simple prayer. 
Father in heaven, your name is holy. I want to see your kingdom inaugurated here on earth the way you envisioned it in heaven. I'd like a little something to eat today. And if it's not too much trouble for you to forgive me my sins, I'll do my best to pass that on to folks who wrong me. And if you could, keep me away from too much trouble. That's simple. That's not the fixed standard I saw. Jesus' most famous parable on prayer has to be that of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And even that parable teaches honest, heartfelt communication with God in the tradition of the patriarchs. It went something like this. Two men went to church on a Sunday morning. One was a Bible college professor, the other was a drug addict. The drug addict went forward during the invitation, got on his knees and said, God help me. While the Bible college professor stood in front of the congregation and said, God, thank you that you did not make me a drug addict. And Jesus said, which of these two people went home with God's approval that day? That parable challenges our judgmental tendencies and calls us to genuine, honest, heartfelt communication with the Father. Two other parables told by Jesus serve to remind us that Yahweh is the God who listens. The parable of the importunate widow, I don't even know what that word means, but the parable of the persistent widow in Luke 18 portrays this poor, defenseless widow trying to extract a measure of justice from a human judge. It is common to interpret this parable as if God is the judge and that the moral of the story is usually something like just keep on pestering God until you get what you want. But twice in this parable, Jesus describes the judge as one who, quote, neither fears God nor cares about men. In other words, the judge is immoral. So he cannot be the picture of God. This parable works in the negative. Sometimes, to get justice, you have to call the insurance company every single day until somebody finally talks to you. God is not like this. The parable of the friend at midnight in Luke chapter 11 works kind of the same way because we do not have to keep knocking on that door to get the Father's attention. If I might paraphrase the point this way, he will see that they get surgery and quickly. Because of Jesus' influence, in other words, Yahweh is the God who listens. He does not have to be cajoled. He does not have to be aroused from his slumber. He is eager and ready to listen to his people. A couple of innovations that come to prayer because of Jesus' influence in the wake of his ministry, death, and resurrection. The first of these innovations in prayer was praying in the name of Jesus. In ancient cultures, a person's name was tied to his or her character, and names often had communicative effect. Abraham, the great father, became Abraham, the father of multitudes. Jesus was so named because it was said he would save his people from their sins, because the Hebrew term, Yeshua, Jesus, means Yahweh's salvation. The name of God is revered in the Jewish tradition as connected to his reputation in the world as Yahweh, the great and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, showing love to thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, but not letting the guilty go unpunished. His name is tied to his character, and to do harm or shame to the name of God was to dishonor his reputation. Jesus taught his disciples to honor the name of God as holy as they prayed. Right? Father, your name is holy. Holy is your name. Hallowed, that's what that word means. If you were living in Kentucky, I would say holified. That's what hallowed means. Here's how he said it. He asked them to protect the reputation of Yahweh by asking them to pray in his name. And here's how it went. He said, I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. The earliest believers continued to pray in Jesus' name, knowing that on the basis of Jesus' reputation, God was listening. John said it best, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. In a limited number of cases in the New Testament, Jesus is addressed in prayer, in only three cases. But the pattern of the New Testament was to pray to God in the name of, or on the basis of the reputation, person, and work of Jesus. Another innovation that was introduced to prayer in the New Testament is the divine assistance of the Holy Spirit. Whereas the prophets, priests, and holy men of Jewish tradition served as intercessors between God and His people, so now the Holy Spirit 
given to every believer, serves as intercessor. And given the tendency toward elitism among those who tend to control access to God, the new covenant ushers in for us the Holy Spirit as the great democratizer, granting all believers immediate access to God. The incarnation of Jesus and his example, teaching, and practice of prayer brings us right back around to where we started with the patriarchs to just converse with God in simple, honest, and heartfelt ways. To speak, knowing that God is listening and eager to hear what his people have to say. It would have been great to end there. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, if we could say, and that's how the people of God prayed from there on until eternity. But alas, as human nature being what it is, that is not the end of the story. Before we move to some concluding remarks, did you hear the word concluding? Yeah. <laughs> about what all this has to do with us, I want to just note a couple of very brief movements about the prayers of the early church. The story of prayer in the early church period, that period right after the apostles are all gone, is that continuing struggle between spontaneity and standardization. The Lord's Prayer, while given as a very simple and honest way of praying, quickly became the standardized prayer uh, of the day. As Jews prescribed set times during the day for prayer and worship, so the early church fathers prescribed a set time known as the daily office. And the Lord's Prayer became the standard prayer in that collection. As Jews recited the Shema and the Amidah at fixed hours of the day, so Christians in the second century prayed the Lord's Prayer at morning, midday and evening. In essence, the Lord's Prayer replaced the Shema among the people of God as the standard daily creedal recitation among Christians of the early church. Those prayer traditions began to grow into longer, more standardized forms as they commandeered Jewish themes and Christianized them for the church. But having said that, careful study has shown that while the early church wanted to retain the Jewish traditions that gave rise to Jesus' piety, it also felt the freedom to adapt those traditions to ensure that their prayers were authentic as they eagerly waited the second coming of Jesus. Historical endeavors aren't just dry and monotonous. I mean, they are, but they're not just that. And so I think that we, uh, the more that we understand history, the deeper and more significant becomes our spirituality. So the very last thing I want to do is draw a couple of conclusions from our studies, things that can help us learn to pray. Not just how to talk about prayer, not just how to study prayer, but things that can help us learn to pray. That's why I do all this. Here's the first thing I notice. Prayer is conversation. Prayer in the biblical tradition is dialogical. It's dialogue. It's not monologue. Conversation with Yahweh is just that, conversation. Walter Brueggemann says it pretty well, that prayer assumes there is something commensurate between the partners, namely a capacity to communicate with one another. Prayer is not a one-way recitation of all our wants and desires, as if God were a genie in a lamp. He is not a religious Santa Claus to whom we direct our one-way wishes. It's a conversation, a dialogue with the God of the universe. And if we expect to go to Him with our wishes and concerns, we have to expect that he has the right to come to us with his wishes and concerns. The prayers of the ancient Near East were by and large monological. Sayings directed at deities who did not speak back. But from the very beginning, Yahweh spoke. The opening verses of Generous, uh, Generous. The first book of the Bible, Generous. <laughs> the opening verse of Genesis says that God created the heavens and the earth. The second verse says that the earth was formless and empty, and the Spirit was hovering. The third verse says, and God said. David says he spoke, and the world came to be. Hebrews says that at God's command, the universe was formed. Yahweh is at his very core, a God who communicates, and prayer with him is at its very best conversation. Of course, Conversation implies not only that we speak our concerns, but that God speaks. And understanding how God speaks is the subject for a wholly different four-hour lecture. I have much more to say on this, much more than you can now possibly bear. But one thing it means for certain is this. Prayer cannot be separated from the reading of Scripture. And the most effective prayers 
in history are almost always, without question, the best Bible readers. If Yahweh is the God who communicates, then our prayers cannot be uttered without a hearing heart. And if we expect God to listen, it is only proper to give Him the same courtesy. Here's the way I say it to my students. We expect that we have the ability to move the Father when we pray. It is only right that God have the ability to move us. The second thing I think we can learn from this brief history of prayer is that there is and perhaps always will be a tension between spontaneous and standardized prayer. When I was a teenager, my youth sponsors told me, when you pray to God, just say whatever's on your heart and mind. And as a teenager, I needed to hear that. And now that's what I needed to hear. I needed to know that God was eager to listen to me and that whatever I said, he would listen to me. But now that I'm older, I've made a habit of exploring what lies down in the depths of my heart. I'm uncomfortable saying whatever's in my heart and mind in the presence of the Almighty. Some of it is pretty dark. If I've learned anything from the patriarchs and anything from Jesus, it's that God values honest communication and that prayer is nothing more than speaking. But on the other hand, one does not always simply saunter into the presence of the Almighty and demand attention. There's a time and a place to be careful about what you say, to finally craft your words as an offering, to be priestly and ceremonial as we speak for others. I think the real value of standardized prayer, if I might borrow a metaphor from Paul, is as a pedagogue. Paul says that the Jewish holiness code was our pedagogue, leading us to Christ in Galatians 3. Pedagogues in the ancient world were primarily those responsible for the schooling of children. And whether they did the teaching themselves, or whether they took the children over the river and through the woods to Anne Shirley's classroom, their main function was education and protection. And that's what standardized prayers do for us. Sometimes they teach us how to pray. The Psalms are a great resource for this. If you want to learn how to pray, take a Psalm a week, or take the Shema, and just pray it over and over and over again for about seven days. Doing so seems standardized and rote, maybe even mindless to you. But at the end of the day, it embeds the way to pray deep down in the operating system of our minds, so that when it's time to really pray, our words are inundated with prayers of the Scripture. Praying standardized prayers also protects us primarily from ourselves. Eugene Peterson, author of The Message, says that when we read the Bible, we tend to invoke the unholy trinity, holy wants, holy needs, holy feelings. I think we do that when we pray. We tend to pray for what we want, pray for what we need, and pray for what we feel. And if we're very good at it, we camouflage it in the language of holiness. But standardized prayers have a way of ridding us of all that. One of the greatest books on prayer that has ever been written was penned by Origen, Bishop of Carthage in the mid-3rd century. Origen is only trying to help his people learn to pray and taught them that they should pray in four categories. We'll read it here. It says four topics which I have found, and according to these, everyone should organize their prayer. The topics are as follows. In the beginning and opening of prayer, glory is to, unless you're a Southern Baptist, that word's pronounced glory, is to be ascribed according to one's ability to God and through Christ. Thereafter, one should put thanksgivings, and after thanksgiving, it appears that you ought to become a powerful accuser of your own sins before God and ask first for healing. And then after confession, ask for the great and heavenly things, both personal and general, on behalf of one's nearest and dearest. And finally, Begin, uh, one should bring prayer to an end by ascribing glory to God through the Holy Spirit. Origen is trying to help his people learn to pray, and he taught them those four categories, the glorification of God, followed by thanksgiving and confession and then supplication. This standardized prayer has educated many of the believers, sorry, excuse me, in, in many circles today, it is known as the Acts Prayer. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Any of you heard that before? And you're taught that it's ancient. It comes from origin. And it has taught many a believer in the mechanics of prayer and protected them from the prayer of the unholy trinity of wants, needs, and feelings. Standardized prayers can be helpful if you used in the right ways and in the right context. Standardized prayers should still come from the heart, and all of our prayers should be heartfelt, genuine, and honest. 
Perhaps the standardized prayers can help us learn to pray until our own spontaneous prayers automatically begin to reflect more and more the prayers of the great praying people of the church. Well, friends, that is a not so brief history of prayer. It is the story of Yahweh, the great and compassionate God, the one who is attentive to his people. It is the story of our heartfelt communication with this God and our struggle to maintain the balance between spontaneous, genuine, honest prayer and more ceremonial liturgical forms. It is the story of the human condition, knowing that we have somehow been distanced from the Father, struggling to do whatever it takes to be close to Him again. And it's the story of Jesus showing us exactly how it can be done. Thank you.